So a friend and I were talking recently about the fact that we are going to have a new heavens and a new earth established where there's no sin, there's there's going to be no fall ever again. But it kind of begs the question, if God is going to bring us to that anyway, why did he permit the fall to happen in the first place? Hi, my name is Emily, and you are listening to the Image Restoration Podcast, Season 1, Episode 1. I originally had a completely different topic planned for this. It was going to be the classic introductory podcast where we talk about, um, you know, what this podcast is going to be, and I was going to go over Image of God stuff, but, and that's all going to come. That's going to be Episode 2. But... I thought, why not just dive right into it? Because I was researching and researching and and compiling this perfect episode. But this topic is so important and it, I believe, hinges on the fact that we're images of God. So thanks for tuning in today. I'm really excited to get started here. Um... It's, it's really a conundrum. And this, this episode is, is not at all researched. It's very briefly researched. <laughs> but it's going to be a lot more just theoretical and stream of consciousness. So I hope that you enjoy kind of joining me in, joining in with me in this conversation about basically the entire timeline of creation and humanity. Um, basically, the end goal is we're going to try and figure out why did God allow the fall to happen in the first place? And what does that say about him and about us? So let's get started. So this is really the biggest problem of suffering, right? Um, this ties back to suffering too, another topic that I'm really passionate about. So, um, but the biggest, one of the biggest questions that people have that prevent them from either coming to God or loving God. Oh, and by the way, before I go any further, um, I have a dog and I'm dogs. I dog sit like all the time. So (laughs) you can't see it right now, but, uh, the dog that I'm dog sitting is sniffing the microphone. So if you hear any noises in the background, it's one of them. Um, but yeah, this is one of the, one of the issues that tends to prevent people from, accepting even just the existence of God. It's, it's the classic question. Why does, why would a good God allow suffering? And it drives us back to the creation account to the beginning story. Why would a good God allow his creation to fall? So this is, this is a really difficult question. Um, it really can raise doubts in, in anyone, even the strongest of believers. It makes us a little bit scared, you know, like, can we trust God to <laughs> not allow suffering to happen? The answer is, is, is yes. Um, the fall is, is a unique scenario in that it, it, it was the first sin. It's not merely a chaotic suffering or calamity, as I uh, prefer to call it. Um, it is... It is a, a sin that was brought on by mankind. Um, but again, if God is all powerful, why didn't he prevent it? Um, so my friend and I were having this conversation about, um, you know, in, in the new earth, will there be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Will there be no tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Will we all just not even have the option to have a fall? Um, we don't know the answer to that. I honestly think it could go either way. Um, I can see there being a tree and there not being a tree. I can see there being a tree and um, perhaps one of the reasons for the fall was so that when we get back into the Garden of Eden, basically, when we, when we re-enter the garden as it was intended to be, um, we will see the tree, but we'll be like, been there, done that. We know what is best now. We, we know on a new level. So there's an, there's, there's like two types of knowledge. Um, there's ascent to knowledge and then there's like belief. Um, I know there's better terms for this. Um, but <laughs> like I said, I'm not very well researched coming into this episode. It's, it's really just a stream of consciousness. So we all know this, um, just a classic example, you know, you have a child, you tell the child, Hey, don't touch the stove. It's hot, right? Do not touch the stove. It is hot. That child knows the fact that you told them, but they sometimes don't really know until they suffer it for themselves, until they disobey and touch the stove for themselves. So perhaps in the new earth, there will be that tree, but we will know now 
that we don't re- actually want what that tree seems to promise, right? We will know on a whole new level. Plus, we will have even be we will even be further improved upon in that we, uh, Paul talks about his mystery union with Christ, being hidden in Christ, being made one with Christ, which I want to get into a little bit later. So, um, in regards to, in regards to the fall, um, one thing that my friend brought up was, um, that God, how could God display his entire glory if the fall hadn't happened? And to me, this immediately raised an issue, that issue being God's glory cannot be diminished, right? So there's a concept um, called divine simplicity. There's a doctrine, not a concept, it's it's reality. <laughs> so there's the doctrine of divine simplicity, which essentially states that God is, was, always will be. He is one. He is always glorious. He is always just. He is always loving. He is always good. He is always one being. He never changes in his nature, in his characteristics. He never changes in um, his will. His will does not change. He doesn't change his mind. He always is unified as one eternal, unchanging being. And I, I want to clarify, I don't mean unified as in... Um, like oneness Pentecostalism. I don't mean that that heresy. Um, so for those who might not be aware, there is a um, heretical belief that, um, you know, Christians believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a heretical belief that th- these three unique persons are not so, that it is one being, one person going by three different names. And this is called modalism. Um, there's other forms of it, but, but, um, the oneness doctrine is a heresy. So when I say that God is unified and he is one, I don't mean that the three persons are not separate, but separate persons, but one being, um, what I'm, what I'm saying is he is of one will and he is of one mind. Um, he does not have divisions of thought. He does not have divisions of character. There's never a time when his wrath is decreased and when his mercy is decreased. They are equally infinite forever. Um, so in suggesting that, how could God's glory be displayed, right? There's something here, but we have to be careful. The, the problem that it poses, again, immediately to me is that God's glory can be diminished, right? In creating humanity... Um, what, what it suggests is that in creating humanity and the world before the fall, his glory was not fully, um, exacted. (laughs) It, it, it was diminished because it was being limited, um, by the fact that these creatures had not fallen and been redeemed. And I guess the answer to this is, you know, I, I'm a millennial. I know memes. The answer to this is yes, but also no, because, um, God did not need us to fall in order to, (laughs) God did not need us to fall in order to have his glory fully realized before creation happened. His glory was fully realized. He was, he existed God refers to himself as the great I am. So unlike us who can say, I was a baby, I am an adult, I will be old, right? God doesn't have past, present, and future. God is a constant is. He's a constant present. And so um, to kind of go off on a tangent, this also um, for people who often, you know, criticize Christianity and say, well, who created God? Well, it's that, that is a nonsense question simply because God does not have a beginning or an end. He exists outside of this past, present, future. He, he is separate from time itself because God is the creator. Everything is created by God, everything, including time. God is not subject to time. Time is subject to God. So no one created God because there is no creation point for God. God simply is, and he created time that has this linear timeline of past, present, future. So that's a tangent. But the point is, prior to creation, right, God's redemptive qualities, his creative qualities 
all of those things were fully realized and he was fully satisfied and existent, self-existent in himself. In creating us, God made creatures that are independent of himself. And so in our finiteness, in light of his infiniteness, his infiniteness never diminished, but our finite sight could not comprehend this kind of infinite God. So I, I, I would answer this question, right? Why did God permit the fall to happen? I would answer this question with, um, essentially to say, you know, the yes, but also no, (laughs) um, God's glory is not diminished by the fact that he made creation, but our vision of his glory is diminished in our existence prior to the fall, sort of like the kid touching the stove again, right? Um, We could be told of God's infinite knowledge and perfect wisdom, but until we have experienced it ourselves, we could not know it in the same way. And so God in his mercy and in his infinite wisdom deemed that the best way for us to learn about the God that we love and serve was to permit for us to go through this path of falling and redemption. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I want, I love kind of, you know, I'm, I hold to reformed doctrines, but I love to sort of poke and prod at my own people sometimes <laughs> because, you know, we, I think, I think we do ourselves a disservice by thinking we have the end answers and we have all the answers. And in, in modern reformed thought, we have kind of reduced God and reduced reality to not include things of mystery and wonder. We are very, and there's, there's a lot of good about this. We are very black and white people, um, uh, people who hold to reformed doctrine. We, we are very, um, crisp and we like things to be well-defined. Um, we even like to, to an extent define the mystery of God. Like these are the areas where God is allowed to be mysterious. Um, but I believe that in other lines of faith, Um, we can find, um, concepts that are flawed, but help verbalize things that we have not dealt with or that we avoid even. So I'm about to refer to something in Catholicism. So bear with me. Um, (laughs) there is a doctrine in Catholicism, um, in English, it's fortunate fall, um, in Latin, I'm going to double check this quickly here. Uh, Felix Kupa, and I'm pronouncing that horribly because I am a Midwestern, um, American (laughs) Felix, Felix Culpa. No, um, it's Felix Culpa. Um, but it, the, in English, it's fortunate fall. And so what the Catholic faith says is that it is fortunate that we fell because there, through our fall, we got to know Christ as redeemer. And I think that this is a notion that's on a good path, but it, it, it brings up a, a very fatal flaw in calling a fall fortunate because we cannot call sin good. We cannot call things that are not of God good. We cannot call what is evil good. You know, that's, that's a big no, no. The Bible explicitly says we cannot do that. So we cannot be saying, oh, it's a good thing that we sinned because otherwise, how else would we have known Christ as Redeemer? But God permitting us to sin is a whole other thing than God causing us to sin. Um, you know, this, this brings up a whole other question. Did God cause the fall? This is really complex. I'm not even going to start to get into that because I'm still researching that myself. But <laughs> but we're go- we are going to go off of the verbiage that God permitted us to sin. God, you know, in, in terms of, of free will and, and um, predestination and stuff like that. You know, I, I believe I'm, I'm a, I'm a full blown, like I, I hold to the five um, Calvinist points, <laughs> five points of Calvinism. I hold to the doctrines of grace that, uh, that we are predestined to be saved. Um, but 
there is there is an element of free will that even Calvinists who truly understand Calvinism recognize. Um, we need to acknowledge that free will exists, but we have to define what free will is. Free will ought to be defined as the ability to do, you know, the, the freedom to do what you are capable of doing, right? So we have free will, but we cannot do what we are incapable of doing. So like in terms of salvation, the reason why Calvinists hold to that, you know, um, we cannot be saved of our own will, right, is because the scriptures talk about us as being dead in our sins and trespasses. A dead person cannot make themselves alive. So if we're we're looking at a corpse, right, (laughs) a corpse has the free will to do whatever a corpse is capable of doing. And what that corpse is capable of doing does not include resurrecting themselves to life, right? Whereas God, who is completely free to do as he pleases, when he, as Jesus, as God incarnate, died, Because he is God, he could raise himself to life. And thus, Christ in us, when he resurrects our hearts to life, he he has that ability. So that's sort of a tangent there. But the point is free will. God permits us to sin because we had the ability to sin. So, right, um, it's not fortunate that we made that choice. It is not fortunate that we were given that ability. Now, you may argue... So, well, why did God give us the ability to sin at all? Well, then you can't argue. If you're going to argue that, you can't argue, oh, God then made us robots, right? Because, you know, that's one of people's biggest complaints against God is like, oh, so we're all just robots, da, da, da. No, no, no. God loves us. He has given us the freedom to choose him or to run away. And in the fall, we showed that we were choosing to run away. So, um, getting back on track here. (laughs) Again, the fall happened because we free will chose to fall. So there's that. Um, In the fall, we came to understand in a much deeper, in a new way, right? That following God, that listening to God, that believing God is the way of life because we chose the way of death. Um, naturally, you know, this kind of makes sense. If, if God is the source of life and we choose what is not um, him, you know, if we choose disobedience to the source of life, we are choosing obedience to death, which God did not want us to choose, but we chose that in and of ourselves. So why... Did God permit the fall to happen? It's not as much for God's sake, right, as it is for ours. God did not need his glory to be more ex- like realized and expanded. It has forever been infinite. It has forever been glorious. It has forever been perfect and whole and realized. But in creating us, he loves us. So much that he's, he, he wants us to know him and to have relationship with him. And so God, in his perfect wisdom, knew that the fall would be a means by which we would know him on a, that experiential level rather than simple knowledge. Because Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. They could have learned all of these facts, right? They could have learned everything like, oh, you know, can you... Like, are you, are you merciful? Like, do you hate? Do you, and God could say, yes, I'm merciful. Yes, I hate, I hate evil. Um, What is evil? Well, that's not for you to know. You don't need to know evil to know and love me. And we decided that we didn't believe that. (laughs) We decided we didn't believe that sentiment of you don't need to have intimate knowledge of evil to know me. But God said, okay, you're going to learn through experiential knowledge, you know, this, this applicational knowledge, um, to know me. God permits the fall to happen and God 
shows us this second person of the Trinity, his son, and this third person of the Trinity, this Holy Spirit. So in the beginning, right, we had an experiential relationship with God the Father. Through the fall and Christ's coming, we have an experiential relationship with God the Son. And through Christ's resurrection and ascension and the Holy Spirit, we have an experiential relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's how I would sum up why the fall had to happen. Now, in the new creation, will there be this tree? This is a really important question to ask um, because God made things and it was good. It, it, it was it was perfect in Eden. Um, so it's kind of confusing to think, huh, if it was perfect, but the tree was there, you know, will we, will we have the tree in the new garden? And you can make a case either way, I think. I think you can make a case for there being a tree in the garden or a tree not being in the garden. Um, the case for the tree being in the garden, right, is that, it still permits for that free will relationship, right? Where we will have the choice to choose God or to rebel. Uh, we will have the choice in love to either listen and obey and choose life, or we will have the free will to abandon God and to choose our own death. Um, now, that's kind of scary because it's like, well, what if this whole thing happens again? But again, kind of like I said before, with the experiential um, knowledge, right, of burning our hand on the stove, right? A child after burning their hand on the stove is not going to go to touch the stove again. <laughs> they know now that that hurts and that burn st sticks with them for quite a while. So in the new heavens and the new earth, there may be a tree. Um, I'm sure that I have not researched this fully, but theoretically speaking, I can I can see how there could be a tree there. And um, th with the tree being there, um, we could not desire it because we know now and we have seen God's glory on a whole other experiential level. The glory that always existed, that always was, that we were given knowledge about but did not believe we could now see that tree and realize, wow, what a stupid little tree, what a horrible secondary, like awful thing. I cannot believe that we ever even considered choosing that. Yes, the option is there, but my goodness, why would I ever run to it? Because I now see how much better God is, right? So, I can see the tree being there. And then this also, uh, you know, this, this sort of, there, there, there needs to be sort of a guarantee that that desire wouldn't come up in us again, which is coming into this union with Christ concept. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there, and here I go again, in Eastern Orthodoxy, I'm going to ruffle some feathers today. This is, this is good. Great start to a podcast. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there is a concept called theosis, um, which in, depending on how you define it, some people say um, it is merely the Eastern Orthodox term for sanctification, um, meaning, um, so for those who might not know, sanctification is a stage of salvation, and we're going to have an episode on holistic salvation in the future as well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent if I keep talking, but there, there is the... Um, uh, the stage of salvation, which is sanctification. So after a believer is saved, as time progresses between between the moment that they are um, um, resurrected, right, in their hearts, th from the moment they are made Christian until death and entrance into heaven, that whole line of time is sanctification. And what that means is through trial, through suffering, through relationships, through, through just enduring the timeline of this life, these believers are crafted to look more and more like Christ, to become one with Christ. Um, because Jesus lived the perfect life. He died a perfect death and he was risen to life again. 
Um, our goal is to become perfect images of Christ, perfect imitators of this perfect human. Um, when Adam and Eve fell, they diminished humanity and what it was intended to be. But Jesus came and lived as humanity was intended to be. He, he was offered that fruit of the tree. You know, we have the, the, the temptation account um, of, of Christ where he was offered sin. He was offered to not be one with God, to not follow in God's leading, to, to run from God's will. And instead, he chose obedience. He chose Eden. He chose life. Um, and then being the perfect sacrifice now, because he lived the perfect life, he died the perfect death in our stead. Um, we ought to have died, but God in his mercy said, no, I want to redeem my creation, not destroy it. And I'm going to redeem it by dying myself because there's no one else that can stand in the place. Now, every human being has been diminished so no one else can enter into that Eden again and no one else can pay the price. Right. So Christ did that on our behalf. Um, so in, in sanctification, we are being made into that perfect human. We are being, we are, are being prepared for eternal glory and that we are being made into Christ's likeness. And that's only made possible because of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy spirit, and because of the second person of the Trinity in his death and the first person of the Trinity in his um, mercy and sovereign will, and the three of them together in coherent will making this story happen <laughs> in reality. Um, so the Bible talks about union with Christ. And so back to this concept of theosis, some people say it's that sanctification, it's that sharpening, that honing, that refining. Um, but then there's a whole other level of it that it can take where it's, we are sort of made one with God himself and being one with Christ, you know, it, it sort of blurs that line between creator and creation. And that's where things get dangerous. So like, like the Catholic idea of, of the fortunate fall, we cannot be calling a fall fortunate because that's going to be calling something evil good. And in the same with the concept of theosis, there's a flaw here that can be made, um, I don't think it's as explicit of a flaw as fortunate fall, but um, there is a flaw that can be made here where the, th the concept of theosis being we become one with God himself, where basically we become deities, we become deified is another word. Um, but there is this mystery because Paul talks about union with Christ you know, it's, it's, it's in the New Testament in many, many places, becoming one with Christ, being hidden in Christ, becoming, you know, like Christ. Um, you know, we, but I think, I think the distinct, the, the distinctive factor is, if I'm not mistaken, there is nowhere in scripture that says we become Christ. And so that, that is the, the distinction that we have to make. So, however, if we become one with Christ, right? Let's, let's, what, what is one with Christ then? Um, we become one with him in his glory. We inherit the glory that he has made possible for us. Um, that glory being that we are restored to the original image of God, the original rulers and co-rulers, um, that we were made to be. Um, so when God made the world, he, gave the divine command to have dominion over the earth, to be fruitful, to multiply, to rule over the earth. Now, this isn't to be mistaken with what a lot of sort of Americanized ideas of dominion are. Dominion often takes a form of um, a malicious dominance where we are in charge, we get to use it at its expense. This dominion is a different kind of ruling. It is a ruling that is a nurturing. It is a ruling that is a guiding and directing towards flourishing. Um, it is a ruling that works with, not against. Um, in fact, it is because of the fall that we work against creation, that we have to labor so intensively to produce fruit <laughs> and that we are working against our own bodies to try and survive. Um, 
But in Eden, that's not the story. The story is earth willingly produces and flourishes. And really what our job is, is to encourage that. Um, you know, and, and Jesus is the ultimate example of this. Um, he led through servitude. He established his ruling and his kingdom through sacrifice. He established that he was king by serving his, um, by serving his citizens, basically. Um, so in being made one with Christ, we are being restored to Imago Dei, um, image of God. So we are images now, like we're, we're still images of God, but we often deteriorate or diminish that image of God's status through our sin. In sinning, we become more animalistic than human, but Jesus was the perfect human. <laughs> so in being made one with Christ, we are restored to that perfect humanity. Um, now, and this, this kind of starts to bring up another thing. Um, FYI, um, Rosie noticed something. She might start barking. All right, Rosie, it's okay. She is a really cute little golden with a pink nose and ears that look like pigtails. She is very, very sweet. Anyway, <laughs> um, maybe I should make her the cover image of, of this post. Um, <laughs> since she's guest starring so much on it, apparently. But <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, yes. So the question arose, um, you know, how could God's wrath be fully displayed without humans? Again, you know, to go back to what I said earlier, um, we've kind of already answered this where it is um, that it's not that God's wrath wasn't displayed, but that we did not know its extent. So, um, like we, we did not experientially know its extent and God wanted us to learn through experience. Um, because then it's a much more intimate knowledge and a much more precious knowledge when we learn things through experience. Right. I think it's kind of one of the same reasons why oftentimes when, you know, we're, we're doing hobbies and, um, we, so, so if, if, if we, um, what, what, there was something recently that I took on that I was like, wow, I have a much greater appreciation for this now because I have done it myself. Um, drat. What was it? Well, I forget, but let's just take the example of, you know, I, I, I like, I like handcrafted soaps. <laughs> I like those little things that smell nice and do nice things. Um, but, um, it's really easy for me to just go to the store and buy these soaps, these, these handcrafted soaps and think, wow, there's so many of them. Like, how is it such a big deal that they're handcrafted, but then to start and make it myself and invest that time in it myself, I, I gain a whole new appreciation for the soap because wow, I, was able to participate in the soaps creation. I was able to participate in, you know, choosing the scents, mixing the ingredients, um, putting it in the mold and everything else that has to be done to make it, um, in making the mold itself. So similarly, um, we can, we have a much, the way we've been wired, we have a much deeper appreciation for things when we partake in them. Um, and I think, you know, also that, that tells us a little more about God inviting us into being co-rulers into being, having dominion over creation with him, because we, um, we are, we were being, having revealed to us the trait of God as ruler and creator when he granted us that ability to share in that with him. Um, so in the same way, we have a deeper appreciation and understanding now of God's wrath, his righteousness, his holiness, his, um, all those traits. Um, where was I? Oh yes. So <laughs> the question that came up in this conversation with my friend was, well, you know, why, um, could, why couldn't God have, you know, displayed this through the angels? Because there were angels that rebelled, you know, um, angels, uh, and have become demons. And, um, we have the enemy otherwise known as Satan or Lucifer who makes various appearance appearances in scripture. So, um, 
because again, to kind of concisely and shortly answer it, that was for us to know God more. It's because we are in relationship with God and this is where image of God comes in again and why I think it kind of hinges on this idea of why God permitted the fall to happen to us because there was already creation that had rebelled against him and he didn't go out of his way to redeem them, right? He didn't go out of his way to redeem angels that had fallen. But for us, he went out of his way to do so. Why? Because unlike angels, we are created in the image of God. We are the Imago Dei. Now, we're a little lower than the heavenly beings per Psalm 8. Um, I believe 8 verse 5, if I'm not mistaken. Um, God created us a little lower than the heavenly beings, but crowned us in glory and honor through his son, through this son of man, um, son of God, son of man, Jesus Christ. Um, So... Um, in, in the fact that we have this special relationship with God, un, unlike the angels, you know, we do not have the same power as the angels. We do not have the same status as the angels do. Um, and that's a whole other topic as to what their role is and their status is, which again is, is one that I'm not as familiar on. I kind of like to speak to what I know and what I know is myself, <laughs> which is a human being, an Imago day. But um, maybe someday we'll get more into that distinction between these two creations. But kind of a, a very brief summary. Um, we are given the opportunity to call God Father, to call Him Beloved, Um, to have relationship with him that angels do not have. It's, It's a familial relationship. So God permitting the fall to happen to us is because that's not a relationship that he has with the angels. Uh, the, the relationship of, of, of this sort of family of, of this son, daughter, um, being united with Christ, the angels don't even get that, you know, He made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, but raises us to this glory and honor. And um, he raises us to this glory and honor through his son. And we are made one with Christ. So this son of God that is, is loved and cherished within the Trinity, this perfect human that has been risen from death to life um, and who is looked at with pure, just love and there's nothing hindering that love from being received by him. We are brought into Christ's being, his image, and we get to receive that relationship and that unadulterated adoration and love. Um, the angels don't even understand that. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's there's um, a scripture passage um, or something where it's like the angels almost look down with envy on us because we have this special connection, this 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 unique this this relationship with God that is unique to the relationship that they have with God. Um, I, I should find that passage quick while while I'm talking here. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, all right. So after a lot of searching, <laughs> um, I I found it. First uh, Peter one twelve. Um, it says it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves them being the angels, not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent by sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Um, all right. Is that what it's referring to? Hang on. Oh, prophets. Ah, should read things in context more often. All right, we're going to read this in context. I'm pulling out my Bible, like my physical Bible. (laughs) Them was not referencing angels. I stand corrected. That was my bad. But them is referencing prophets. So here we actually have a really great example of showing the relationship of the the persons of the Trinity and of um, God's divine timeline of um, sort of really uh, just experientially carrying out um, his will in our lives. So here we go. 
So salvation in and of itself, you know, we're talking about why did God permit the fall? And the fall is, is a keystone part of the ultimate salvation story because there's no salvation story without the fall. There really isn't. Um, so, and again, um, going back to the fourth, is it, is it good that the fall happened then so we could experience salvation? Well, well, no, it's like salvation is a story that never had to happen. But in God permitting it to happen, there's a greater glory that we now experientially know. Um, so First Peter 1, starting in verse 10, concerning this salvation, um, and prior to this, he, he really delves into the wonders of this salvation. So go and read that. But um, verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. So here we're in the Old Testament looking at the prophets. They searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he preached the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So the Spirit of Christ in them. This is interesting, right? So what does that that mean, the Spirit of Christ in them? Well, if we look at John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The word is Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, as it also says in John 1. Um, so the word of God came to us through the prophets, right? In the Old Testament. This is really cool. And I'm, I'm sort of just making this connection as I'm talking um, between this passage and the Old Testament. So whoo, this is exciting. Um but the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. So the word of God, Jesus Christ himself was in the beginning with God in creation. He always was, always will be. And he is God as told to us in John one in the old Testament, in the prophets, Jesus was active. He was there revealing the word of God to the prophets. Thus saith the Lord, right? The prophets repeat this all the time. Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord says in in more modern English lingo. So let's keep reading. So I'm going to start again in verse 10 so we get everything in context here. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ, his crucifixion, and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. So it was revealed to these prophets that they were not serving themselves in these revelations, but that they were serving us in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit from heaven. So why are the prophets doing this for our sake? So that we can look at these prophets from centuries back and it bolsters the personhood of Christ. We see Christ working in them, predicting his own life on earth. We see Christ live out that life that was predicted, die, resurrect, and ascend into heaven. So all of those prophecies are for our sake so we can look back and have more assurance of the divinity of Christ. Okay, that's a tangent. But now to finish up this little passage. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. There's that third person of the Trinity. Things into which angels long to look. So we are receiving a special knowledge that angels do not get to experience or look into. It's being revealed to us and the angels are seeing it happen and they're, it, it amazes them as well. This salvation narrative, this fall and redemption um, that has happened. Um, so it's not, um, so it's the, the fact that we are the image of God and angels are not, we needed to, um, in order to be made images of God again, essentially, because we fell from that status, right? We kind of, we diminished it. Um, in order to be made images of God again, we needed that redemption through Christ. And we, through Christ, we have that relationship with our father, with our bridegroom, um, because we are images of God and angels are not. <laughs> we always were meant to have that relationship as, as children and as um, co-heirs with Christ. 
Um, but it is through the fall and through the redemption that we have this experiential knowledge that we have this deeper appreciation and this more complete love of God um, than had we simply been told. And now that we have experienced that burning stove for ourselves, (laughs) we know now that it is God's will that is perfect, that it is our creator that is worthy of all praise and adoration and obedience and submission, that it is not us, um, that it is all him. And I know that for some people, this might make more questions than answers. So please feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook at Hello Emily Urban. Um, that is, you know, the at symbol, Hello Emily Urban, H E L L O E M I L Y U R B A N on all platforms. So feel free to reach out to me there with any questions or concerns you may have. If you want, um, I love voice memos, so feel free to email me a voice memo question as well um, or attach it. Um, I believe that um, some. Um, Uh, I know Instagram lets you do voice memos, Facebook lets you do voice memos, or if you want to attach it to an email and send it to hello at emilyurban.com, that is welcome as well. You can find me on my website, emilyurban.com, where I blog about such things and I um, try to focus on more applicable um, theology (laughs) in that you can just go out and start living what you have learned. Um, and hopefully you are encouraged and you find some healing and, um, there's, it's, it's really a focus on suffering there. Um, so because we all suffer and I know that it can be really hard with the questions that it raises. So hopefully you can be encouraged in your suffering through, uh, the things that I write. Um, if you want to help me, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash hello, Emily Urban. I am working on getting some special things for patrons. So, um, stay tuned for that. One of which will be for one of the higher level patrons to actually get a free copy of a book that I'm writing, um, which will hopefully be ready by the end of the year. So, All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to episode one of the Image Restoration Podcast, and I hope to see you next week. Um, And yeah, be blessed and have a great day. (laughs) Bye.